band sings a song, you know, and prayer is an instrument of war. And I believe that. I believe that we can pray and that's part of it, but I also think praise can also be an instrument as well. In this battlefield we're on, I'm looking at Psalm 150, the last Psalm in the Psalter. Easiest Psalm to read and perhaps to mm, not give too much thought to. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the ferment of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Kind of interesting that it's, there's hardly anywhere that you can read here without encountering the word praise. And it's the simplest of all the Hebrew words for praise. We say the word hallelujah. This is the word hallelujah. Ya, yawa, short, yawa, hallelujah. So first, let's talk about praise, as this psalm opens. Praise. If you read this real carefully, let me do what I am very famous for, which is how many books can you open up at the same time? <laughs> you would not want to see what happens at my desk. That would confuse anybody. Do it like that. So, first, where? It says, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the ferment of his power. And I put a little side note here. Where with a question mark, earth and heaven. And we say that's kind of a strange observation, but if you think about it, it's truly not, because we've got this picture given to us in Revelation. Don't turn there. I'm turning for you, and I'll read it to you. Here's a praise, if you want to call it a praise festival going on, with the four and twenty elders. And it says, they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And if you keep going, you read on, and it talks about these, the same kind of praise that's going, where it says, Every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne. There is your praise, heaven and earth. So where? Here's the reverse, earth and heaven. His sanctuary. Well, in, in the time of the writing of the Psalms, we know everything was geared towards the temple. But we can talk about we being the temple of the Holy Spirit the church, so individually and corporately, the praise of individuals as the temple of the Holy Spirit and corporately as the church, as his body. And then, not that you need a reason why, but why, verse 2, why? So verse 1 would be where, verse 2 would be why. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. So two things are being said here, the mighty acts, let's see, get to the right place here. So a few things are 
kind of being said, but essentially we have an interesting word for um, his mighty acts. And the Hebrew is kind of broken up a little bit. We have hallelu-hu, hallelu-hu. And mighty acts, we have here a translation of a word you, you'll find familiar. I'll tell you the inside. It's got a prefix b, but gabu, gaburete, from gabur, the, the great mighty. Uh, we've got that word that reoccurs, warrior, uh, a man of war, of power. So when it says, praise him for his mighty acts, they are acts or works of power. Why? Because he created everything. He spoke everything into existence. And if you're listening to me tonight and you don't believe that, I don't just tune me off right now because the rest of it is not, not going to help you. If you think that somehow you, if you want to believe that you came out of a single fish egg somewhere, be my guest. Or that you evolved from an ape. If you'd like to believe that. I only have one problem with all those people in their argument for uh, evolution, which is what has happened to us in the last, oh, maybe say two or three thousand years. We haven't evolved. If anything, we have mutated in a negative way. I don't know what that's, what would you say if evolution is going, progression of going forward, we what, devolved? <laughs> I don't know what to say about that, but praise him for, as the King James says, his mighty acts. Just think biblically for a minute, his mighty acts, the acts in creation that are given to us, the account of creation, the account of let us make Adam Man, in our image, mighty acts, mighty acts of his grace, of his deliverance. I mean, you just keep going on and on. It's, it's endless, mighty acts, including straight into the New Testament, that he would not leave his people or his creation, but chose to come in the flesh to clothe himself in a tent we could recognize and reveal himself to us, not in a pillar of cloud or fire, but in flesh that we could look at and identify with and spoke to us as we speak. That's mighty acts and his excellent greatness. Hebrew says, same word, we have another hallelujah. They're all hallelujah words. Kareb, or karob, gedolo, for his surpassing greatness. So if somebody says, why, why, would, why would you need to ask why? But if you had to ask why? I want you to think about this because oftentimes we don't recognize the Old and the New Testament have some parallel concepts, 1 Timothy 1, 7, I think it's 1, I got to check it out, I think it's 1 Timothy 1, 17. Brain sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't. Let's see what this says here. Could be quoting something else to you, like what you do, do quickly. First Timothy, brain's working tonight. First Timothy 1, don't turn, I'll read it to you. 1, 17, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I have Paul writing to Timothy a praise of who God is. King of kings, Lord of lords, a praise cloaked in the New Testament, but really not cloaked. Just think about that. A lot of times I think we, we think the Psalms contain these type of words, but in the New Testament, think of how many times Paul's writing especially has that 
praise, honor, worship factor to it. So why? Because he is, he created, he doesn't have to be, but he is who he is. He's given us sight to see, I'm speaking spiritually, ears to hear his excellent greatness. We could have been among those that were not chosen. I mean, you know, you, at some point you can almost get so familiar with some of these passages that you just go, eh, okay. But I've thought about this. What if I remained among those people that never was woken up out of slumber and never taken out of darkness? So praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for healing. Praise him for, for just being the God that he is. And then if you move on, there's a whole cluster of things that, you know, they don't really seem applicable to us. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Okay, well, maybe we can get Joe to do that. <laughs> Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Oh, find somebody else to do that. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Oh, get Larry to do that. <laughs> Praise him with the stringed instruments. Oh, we got Dan and Pete. Mike and organs, you know, we just named the whole band, right? <laughs> Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. But stop for a minute and think of what's being said. I, this envision, this conjures up describing a joyful, festive time of praise and loud music, but think of something. The instruments themselves alone, void of the hand of man, cannot ring out praise. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. What does that take? Breath and fingers. Now, when you think about it, we tend to think of, oh, these instruments are playing, but who's playing them? Because the instruments themselves, praise is not in the instrument. It is what we bring through those instruments and what God has given us, the digits, the fingers, the breath, to be able to do so. The dance requires a body. Even if the body is bound in a wheelchair, the top part of the body can still move, but it requires a body and a living body, not a dead one. All of these require God creating and making us and giving us the ability. Think about this. How many people just in this room, don't put cameras on anybody, has wanted to play an instrument but did not discipline themselves and therefore if they picked one up right now, we'd all go running for the exit door. Okay. That's, uh, glad to, uh, goodly, I'm glad to know that God gave you another gift. <laughs> My point is, not all have been given that discipline. I'm sure we can all limp through something. But on top of giving us the fingers and the breath and the ability to, to pick up the body to move, he's given the gift as well for some people to have understanding and to have the facility or for those who don't to learn and the discipline for those who don't to learn and to at least limp through. But it all requires his creation to be able to do this. The instruments themselves, they are quiet and dormant. Look over there. Are they praising? The guitar is just, the, car, the guitar has been on that stand kind of going, yeah, I'm bored. And that big bass is just sitting there looking at all of you and smiling, but they're not doing anything. It takes the human and that's why I said, when you think about praising God, you have to think about, don't think about just these instruments that are being named, because it's easy to just think of this and, and read the instruments, but forget that it takes the person behind them. It takes the motivation of that person. There are people who are incredible musicians, but they are atheists and they have no desire. They play secular music. They have no desire to give any praise or any credit or any glory to God. It's God that gives the mind and the heart to be able to turn towards him and say, now with, with the hands that you've blessed me, with the breath in my lungs, with the eyes, or maybe 
Maybe it's limited eyesight but heightened hearing, whatever that is that God has given the ability. So all of these are praising. And the sixth verse kind of sums it up because it says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Nothing excluded. I sometimes I take walks and I'll hear birds and I've kind of often had discussions in my own head. I wonder what the birds are saying. You know, when birds chirp, they make noises. But could it be that we who, you know, there'd be people in bird universe who will say, wow, that what I'm about to say is wacky. And I might say what they're saying is wacky. But how do we know that the sounds that the animals make aren't in themselves some form of communication Godward? We don't know that. They're his creation. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And I think when you look at the whole psalm, you've got where, you've got why. We might say the, the how or the who, which is all of these. And what's beautiful is tucked in this word is a little play on something. Just to tell you how unique this word is, the word for praise. And most of you who have been here any amount of time will be familiar with the two words associated, or their two lexical um, definitions or explanations. But our word for praise, if you go first to its, the core of it, halel, is to be boastful. And you can, if you're familiar with Hebrew, you can go through all the verbs, all the forms, essentially, and see they can be, it can be, praise can be intense. It can be many different things as you go through the Hebrew. But what's interesting is if you go back, you have a word that is, it's associated with, they're spelt exactly the same, to shine. So to be boastful, to praise. If you go back to the first uh, example, it says to shine uh, as in a lamp, a flashing forth of light, heavenly bodies. And nestled right between these two words, and you have to be very careful with the Hebrew because you've got vowel changes that change and do change the word. But I thought it's interesting that nestled between, turn it this way, nestled between what is, I'll just point to the English to shine, because if you can read that, halel, and down here, they look the same, to be boastful, is, is another, another similar looking word. And where you encounter that word, if you want to look with me, it's kind of interesting, because it'll tell you, sometimes we read things in English, and the tragedy of not being able to see what exactly is there? In Isaiah 14, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And son of the morning, the morning, the morning star, the shining one, Hillel, between to shine and to be boastful is how Isaiah 14, 12 is describing son of the morning, Lucifer. Chief crowning musician, right? Fallen. What was the music for but to praise? So I, I love the way if you read in here, you can see how easily things can be warped because he's still being called son of the morning. We might say son of brightness, but nestled in there, it seems very clear to me that this passage has the conceit, the lifted up in pride, I will, I will, I will, I will, which is boasting, but not praising, boasting in another way, which is of the self and of self-achievement. So. Nestled in between these words is a great sense of how 
you know, you get that expression, a fine line between love and hate, nestled right between the words to shine and to be boastful or to praise, is this word that's very similar looking. It is of the same origin, if you will, and it is the shining one, the sun of dawn, but it's referring to Lucifer. So, you know, when you think about these words, they're, they're very important. And they give clarity because it tells you this one was the crowning chief musician and that music was for what? It wasn't for entertainment purposes, it was for praise. And how easily just a slight change in a vowel brings us to this fallen one. And how easy it is for us, not by a change of a vowel, but just by a mindset to not take the time to praise, to think on the things that God has gloriously done. I think about the miracle of salvation. You know, many people in different ministries, they look for special miracles. You know, there was a preacher who claimed that in one of his services, they raised a man from the dead. Oh, be careful. Maybe they were all dead. <laughs> he claimed he raised a man from the dead. Listen, I'm not one of these people who um, disbelieves, um, but I, I'm, I've seen enough phony stuff, and I've seen enough phony stuff to just say, okay, you know, I, I think if the man was dead, <laughs> I hate to say it like this, but if the man was really dead, and this preacher brought him back to life, where God, through the preacher, brought him back to life. I think this dead man brought back to life would probably be on a world tour. Don't you? I remember Dr. Scott telling the story about the boy with the, the glass eye. You know, how he could you know, the miracle of how he could read and his healing. But, you know, when Dr. Scott went to uh, inquire, you know, the kid couldn't come out to talk. There was always some excuse. You know, there's a lot of crazy stuff. But we don't have to go looking for those incredible things. We just have to look for the everyday miracles that he does, and the beginning of which is salvation. The miracle, just the, and it is, it's a miracle. Think of the people that you read about in this book, and I think at times because we're reading a book, it's flat to us. And Zacchaeus, who was otherwise known as a, a thief, a skimmer, the miracle recorded of his salvation, whatever happened when they went inside that house, who knows, but he came out and he was a changed man. That's a miracle. Some would say, well, it'd be a better miracle if you talked about the man who was waiting at the pool and he was waiting there and every time, you know, the waters were troubled first in the pool, it'd be a much greater miracle to see that man get up. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful miracle. But the type of thing I'm talking about, you give God the praise for. Well, maybe people have trouble giving God praise and thanksgiving because they don't exactly know where to begin. You ever been given something by somebody and it's beyond words? I'm talking just in the flesh now. Your kid, your wife, your husband, somebody, a friend. They give you something and it's beyond words. And it may not be the most expensive thing. It's something maybe that, you know, they absolutely have no money and they can't afford but they went out and they bought beyond their means. They, they gave you something, or they gave you something that was so precious in their eyes, an alabaster box. They gave you something that was so dear to them. That's almost, that's beyond comprehension. That feeling that comes, that's, I, I don't know exactly what to say, even writing a, car, a thank you note would be insufficient to express. And then multiply that by a billion regarding the starting point of everything, your salvation. 
that miracle is worthy enough to sit down right now and say, Lord, I, I just give you the praise, hallelujah, that you looked upon me and that you saw me where I was and you found me where I was. And maybe the path to you was a little crazy and still is. But I praise God for every moment from the time I became aware and looking back now to the time I was not aware how you guided and protected me. Not sure where to start praising tonight. Maybe the praise I said where and I talked about the why and I'm probably still talking about the why and the who is us. Maybe tonight you're sick and you're asking God to heal you. And I'm going to say something so very strange and maybe even misunderstood by people. But even the sickness you start praising God for because it's brought you to a closer relationship where you are like a life support or an umbilical cord. Without that, there would be nothing. And you start thanking God. I, I shared with you um, what the doctors found inside of me. And I was praising God for the opportunity that God would look out for me like he has so many times before. And I, sometimes I just sit and I think, you know, why, like they sing that song, what, what did I ever do to deserve that? But God, I praise him for taking such good care of me. You know, some people wait for a friend of mine whose mother passed away from ovarian cancer, and it was so late before they even found out what was wrong with her, stage four cancer. Now, I don't have cancer in the ovaries, but I have a cyst. And I just started praising God and saying, thank you for another opportunity. And yeah, maybe in my case, I'm speaking now, I'm sharing my thoughts with you. Strange thing to praise God about. But at the same time, it's given me, again, a deeper level to just sit down and make time to just tell God, not, not asking, not coming into your presence, and I'm not saying, Lord, will you do this for me? And will you do this for me? Thank you for everything you've done. A spirit of gratitude. Maybe for some people tonight, as we pray, for those who are in the grips of an addiction, maybe tonight those people are sitting in their homes listening and saying, praise God for the saints and my brothers and sisters who are praying for me, for my deliverance. Thank you, Lord, for putting me in a place where people care enough about me to pray for me, not to judge me, not to condemn me, but to pray for me. Lord, I give you the praise for the ability to just sit here tonight and know that somebody is praying for me. Want me to give you more reasons? Because I could sit here and just keep going. And I don't think I could run out of reasons. But I don't need one. Simply that he's God. Simply that this one who did all these magnificent things in the universe that our great uh, scientists and those people who study the planets and the galaxies are just beginning to discover what God already put out there and created. That same one condescended to come to me and to you. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I don't know what your, your place of praise is tonight, but like the one out of, remember I have a one-track mind, like the one that came back out of the ten 
the nine that did not come back, the one that came back to thank and to praise and to fall at the feet of Jesus and to worship him and to give thanks. Like that one, they all prayed, Lord, have mercy. But one came back and gave the praise. And for some of us tonight, we're giving praise for things he's already done that are truly in the past. And maybe for some tonight, we're giving praise for what he has not yet done. It hasn't yet been put into action, but he is doing and will do, and therefore we praise him for what he's already done. Does that make sense? Well, then we've got a lot of praising to do, past, present, and future. Now, this small example of the psalm I was in, Psalm 150, as I said, ends with the declaration, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So those who have heard, you know, you, if you still have breath in your lungs, you know, God has given you the ability, and maybe you don't play an instrument, but you can certainly open your mouth to Him and give Him the glory, past, present, and what He is yet to do, future. Get on the telephone. Come to this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord. 